Hi everyone, welcome. I declare this meeting of the Planning Committee for the Port Phillips City Council open and I welcome the members of the party, public who I think are largely outside uh, tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully honours, uh, acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boon We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to the land. Council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted. There's a time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. During public question time, members of the public can ask specific questions on planning matters other than those relating to a topic that is on the agenda tonight. I've made a mistake on that personally and tried to ask general questions, got into trouble. Um, there is also an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question and or make a comment on a specific item in tonight's agenda. This will be done prior to the committee considering the item. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form that is available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. And of course we want you all to contribute but limit your contribution to three minutes. And please, please, please don't um, repeat anything that's already been said. Having said please, please, please. Bit of a hypocrite. Please note that this committee can only <laughs> address questions and deal with items within its delegation. That is planning matters. The decisions of this committee are final and can be acted upon. Please note that all planning committee meetings are now being live streamed. Live streaming and recording allows the community to watch and listen to meetings in real time, providing greater access to Council's decision making and debate, and improving openness and transparency. The live stream of this meeting is available on Council's website, and the recording of this meeting will also be available to view a few days after the meeting on Council's website and YouTube channel channel. The cameras will film and record councillors at this meeting, however, care is taken not to record or film mem images of members of the public. However, if a member of the public asks a question or makes a comment, that they might not be filmed, but you will be recorded. It will be heard on the live stream and recorded. Please note, in accordance with council's local law, that this meeting cannot be filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the chair. In the unlikely event of an urgent emergency evaluation, please follow the instructions of the Chief Warden. Sorry, what was that? Okay, apologies. I don't have any apologies, so I'll move on. Minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting held on 14 November uh, 2018, both uh, in public and the confidentials have been circulated. Are there any questions in relation to these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to uh, confirm these? Move Councillor Voss, seconded Councillor Gross. Speakers against, all those in favour? Carried. Declarations of conflict of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? Public question time. Councillors, we have no questions, I believe. We do if they're on planning. Um, now, can I just say, uh, Councillor, question time. Are there any questions for the officers within the planning room? Ed? So, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to take this out of order. So I'll move to the presentation of reports, but because we have um, some uh, issues of uh, people having to leave, um, I'm going to go to uh, agenda item 6.7, 6.8 and 6.9 first. So let's start off with 6.7. 15 to 87 Gladstone Street, Port Melbourne. There are no members of the public. Councillors, do you have any questions? If not, oh, there, quickly, you got in. Councillor Voss. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to ask um, about 
uh, the likelihood of a precedence being set should um, we approve uh, this development creep, if you like, over the boundary of the property? Through you, Mr Chair. Um, the extent of um, protrusions being sought here at 550 mil is greater than uh, Council typically supports. Um, but um, it is in addition to whatever permissions is granted by the state government being the RA for this application is also subject to uh, permission through our property section and is being a protrudence over one of our footpaths. And uh, some protrudences of, in excess of this have already been allowed on a case-by-case -case basis um, around the council, uh, around the municipality. So this would not be the first um, uh, application of its type. So in that case, that instance, not a, not a precedent. Any further questions? Any resolutions? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Which, which, which item are you interested in? Yeah, which, 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 which address? Okay. Sorry, which one are you? Oh, Hewenden. Okay, we'll get to that soon. We're doing, someone has to go, so we have to do some others first and then we'll come back to the rest of the agenda. Oh, Pleasure. Okay. Um, councillors, do I? So we're doing three be before we get even to the main agenda. So, councillors, is there a uh, a uh, resolute motion that can be moved. Councillor Voss. Just wondering, is, is the applicant here at all? Not according to my list. No, because one of the questions I had is why are they um, developing where they are rather than nearer the park first? And I know, that's a good question. Yeah, I was quite interested in that, but since the applicant's not here, I can't ask that question anyway. Okay, so it's been moved. Has it moved, Councillor Voss? That's the officer's rec. Um, seconder? Councillor Copsey? Councillor Voss, do you wish to speak? Well, just briefly, it just, this has been a long and chequered history and hopefully this will be the last iteration before, the, before it's actually building. Um, it is a, in a prime location right next to Kirrett Park, but I am in two minds about, about this creep, but I guess the best thing is to have it controlled rather than not control it at all. So um, that's why I'm supporting uh, the Section 72 amendment. Thank you. Councillor Copsey, no. Other councillors? We'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Um, agenda item 6.8, 19 Salmon Street, Port Melbourne. I'm advised that there are no uh, speakers from the public. Councillors, are there any questions? I thought there was one, but not. No, no. Councillors, questions or resolutions? Councillor Brand. I suppose I just want to run over the, a couple of things with officers before we go to the vote. Um, could officers... Uh, I suppose um, outline the, um, the status of our heritage... Uh, of, our own, of our own heritage policy on this site and the... It's, I guess it's current status in the situation we're in now because it, obviously it got, over, it got overturned or ruled out in that, in that uh, period uh, at the beginning of 2017. But I'm just wondering what its status is now. 
for you, Mr. Chair. The status now is that the heritage overlay applies to the eastern, um, approximately one third of the site. Um, if we go to the report, councillors, and the illustration on page 792 of the agenda, uh, the area marked in orange on figure one and the photo shows the extent of the heritage overlay as it applies today. Um, and you can see uh, the uh, photo of the buildings um, in that image as well. Any further questions? That is, I just want to confirm, well, that's, that is the area which is considered um, significant, isn't? I thought there was more out the front that was um, also significant than than what's shown on that photograph. For you, Mr. Chair, the area that is in the heritage overlay now is consistent with the findings of the independent panel, which reviewed the interim heritage controls, which applied um, um, at the time that council first saw this application, um, and those controls applied to the whole of 19 Salmon Street plus additional land uh, across Tarver Street or the Tarver Street extension, which is the old uh, experimental um, uh, section of the Roots Chrysler operation. Uh, the panel heard submissions from council and from the applicant um, and uh, was the umpire, so to speak, of which parts of the building had primary, secondary or, in their view, no significance. The area in orange, um, which is the current heritage overlay, equates generally to the areas identified as being of primary and secondary significance. I'm sorry, so does, does council consider any of that red part as secondary as well as primary? Or, I mean, is that just a cover all square or is it, is, it, is it council's heritage policy that that is the significant area? The area there essentially equates to the 1940s buildings, the buildings which were associated initially with the tank uh, or proposed tank factory um, and um, later taken over by Roots Chrysler and expanded beyond that by Roots Chrysler. Um, the status of that land is that it's in a heritage overlay and uh, my understanding uh, um, uh, is that that is basically seen as um, of heritage significance from council's point of view. The question is, um, with a heritage overlay, that introduces a control which says you must get a permit for demolition, but it does not prohibit demolition. It means that council or the responsible authority can consider the merits of uh, some demolition or total demolition. If there aren't any more questions, I'm happy to move a motion. But You're happy to move what? Re refusal? Okay, um, Councillor Brown's moved a refusal. Oh, sorry, are there more questions? Uh, I just want to, I just want to, I'm oh, really Council. confused by this one. So, did we go to VCAT to say, is the, was the interim heritage overlay by the panel before or after we went to VCAT saying, no, we don't want, we want it all considered? So which, which, presump, which came first? Free, Mr. Chair. The sequence of events, uh, best of my memory, is that at the time that Council considered the report or considered the application, um, the interim controls applied at the time that Delwop officers prepared their report, interim controls applied. At the time the Minister eventually got to see the report and signed 
of his decision, uh, the interim controls did not apply. And uh, at the time that uh, council took the matter to VCAT, the heritage controls did not apply. Consequently, council's appeal was struck out as being uh, not valid. Um, and uh, not a short time or short time later, the interim controls were reinstated. So just to make sure, Mr Gutteridge, I've got this correct. So, so we wanted a larger portion of this site to be considered under the heritage overlay. Because of a, a, a delay in the minister signing off on it, we didn't get what the extent of the heritage overlay as we would like. And now we're being asked to consider demolishing part of that thing that initially we wanted to keep. Is, is that, am I missing anything? Free, Mr Chair. Council's position was opposition to this townhouse development um, overall because we believed it was an underdevelopment of a site relative to the ambitions of uh, achieving the vision of uh, Fisherman's Bend. Part of that refusal was also to do with the extent of demolition of the site. Okay. Oh, look, I think this issue has been clarified, but Councillor Voss. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor, I'd like to ask about um, a scenario uh, that might happen should Council today decide to um, uh, uh, refuse this, uh, given that the plans are due to expire on the 1st of February 2019. Um, can you walk me through a likely scenario that would happen? For example, um, I assume that they will apply for an extension and I assume that they will then take um, the decision to VCAT should the minister... Uh, can you just walk me through what might happen? I'd just like to see. OK. Um, it's not unusual for major developments to... Uh, rub up against their um, commencement expiry dates and to seek extensions of time. Um, if the responsible authority um, was to refuse an extension of time, yes, there is a right of appeal against that uh, refusal. Um, council or responsible authorities in making a decision on extension of time must give weight to a, a number of criteria, including whether the applicant has um, land banking the application, whether there's been significant changes to planning controls, um, whether the applicant has made um, genuine attempts to progress the application, uh, matters along those lines. So uh, if this council was to, um, to uh, refuse, uh, or sorry, if the minister was to refuse uh, the application, there is um, uh, appeal rights. Um, but um, I might defer to Mr I, Borg here about I, I, whether I, we would I, have standing. I can add sure. through that through you, uh, Mayor. Um, so if there is a request for an extension, the practice normally is that the first extension is usually approved. So, and this will be the first extension for this permit. Um, so then the next question will be, if we refuse the application, the but the matter won't be the discussion of the extension, even though we are now recommending referral authority and believe that the department will refer the request for the extension to us also. Um, however, if we refuse this application, um, that is, we again, in our role as a recommending referral authority, the minister, it's not determinative. If we are a determining authority, that would be then be the responsible authority must refuse it. So the minister still has discretion to not support our decision and approve this 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 change as well. So that's available. We we also can have an appeal right. That is something that could be available to us as well and take the matter to appeal. What we need to work out, and Mr Guttridge has provided a, um, an A3 plan here um, and, and available to all the councillors, is showing essentially where the approved master plan of the site is and showing where the development would be. The demolition that's proposed through here really is in addition to the preamble of the permit. There is currently a provision to demolish 
this section of the building under the capital city zone. So you require that under the capital city zone. What was the gap and what's the gap that council raised as part of its submissions previously until the heritage overlay was um, ceased and then recommenced was that you know that you needed a permit for demolition. That was, a, uh, that was our argument when we were saying you're demolishing too much. And at that point, from my recollection, there was a heritage overlay applied to the whole site at that point. So what really is, they already have approval for, for demolition on the site under the capital city zone. They only do not have approval for demolition under the heritage overlay. Now, would we win that at tribunal? Is that an argument we would need to take? I'd have to give my opinion to councils that would be very difficult to achieve because you already have approval, you already have improved development, even though it's not endorsed. I think it would be a difficult um, argument for us to put, particularly that uh, it's been very, made very clear in the report that council's heritage advisor supports demolition with appropriate notations in there as well. Okay, are there any further questions or can we move to a resolution? Anyone? I'm going to move the officer's recommendation. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, Councillor Brand, you've got a, a refusal. Put, put your microphone on, please. It's an alternative recommendation which is up there. Okay, it's an internal, it's, it's a alternative recommendation which is up on the screen. Um, and uh, don't speak to it yet. Okay. We've got to get a seconder. What is it? Just do it. Advises the Minister. You're seconding it? Right, so it's been moved and seconded. Councillor Brand? Okay. Um, the fact that this, this building um, has a, a previous permission of some, of, of, of some sort um, to demolish this part of the building is, in, is, a, is entirely regrettable, and, it's came, and it came in a very particular way, which was unusual. It came, it was a decision made by VCAT at a time when the City of Port Phillips, I think, pretty unambiguous policy was temporarily inoperative. So I don't know, they may well have made that decision on the fact that there was no operative um, heritage uh, position on it at that moment. Now, our, our heritage uh, position on it, our heritage policy, our heritage protection does apply, so I think that would be at least a different condition that uh, the Minister or VCAT or whatever might um, take into account looking at it again. Our policy, is, our policy itself, I think, is absolutely un unambiguous. It's a heritage building with an area of particular now, which we've, we've, which we've delineated an area of particular significance which is about the, the, the uh, eastern third of the building, including the factory, uh, the, uh, including the offices and, and drawing rooms along uh, uh, Salmon Street and, a large, and, a, and a, about a third of the factory building behind, which was the, in fact the part of the factory that was built during the Second World War at the time when this was a tank factory some of it might have been built just before as well, when it was a truck factory. But anyway, it has a, it's a hugely important uh, part of, um, of uh, Fisherman's Bend's heritage. I would say in Wirraway, this site itself is probably the most important single site in Wirraway for the, the future of um, that portion of Fisherman's Bend. And it's certainly one of the... It's got the greatest heritage significance the greatest potential to be used in a creative and interesting way to actually give this place both character and amenity and a sense of it being a, a city with a history. Uh, and it is entirely regrettable the way this, build, this whole building is proposed to be developed, which is a very, very bland um, and unsympathetic uh, rollout of, um, 
four-storey townhouses. We've seen the results of that in Ingle Street. Um, at the other end of Fisherman's Bend, uh, it's, it's, a, life, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, a, a lifeless sort of uh, development, nothing but just trees and glass boxes. Uh, whereas this, having, having um, this element of heritage uh, <coughs> fabric at, at this far end would improve it um, imme immeasurably. By inconveniencing it, it will improve that, that development. It'll, it's, that area under the sawtooth roof there could be, they could rip off the, um, uh, the roof and um, st still under the heritage protection and use all the framework as, say, a framework for growing vines and things for a, a public garden or it could be a canopy over a public open space or it could be a market. It could be a whole lot of things which would be absolutely important on this central intersection of, uh, of uh, Wirraway under its most important piece of, 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 of heritage. I, I think there is no possible, there's no possible reason that we as council would want that p portion of the building which we, ha which we are protecting Demolished. There's just there's just none. It, there is the inconvenience of going and defending it, maybe against greater odds. I don't know, but I think it is absolutely our duty to go and defend it, or at least tell the minister that we would we would defend it, and explain to the minister why. I just can't see any other possible reason for not uh, for not unanimously saying we do not believe this part of this very, very important building that we have already delineated should be allowed to be demolished. Mm -hmm. It's a concession Thanks for the development much. that we don't, um, don't need or want particularly. Thanks very much, Councillor Brand. Councillor Voss. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with Councillor Brand. Um, this Roots Chrysler factory is incredibly important to our city and also to the history of Fisherman's Bend. Um, we need to set about preserving as much as we possibly can of the old fabric, and this is all part of it. Um, you know, with the beautiful offices buildings there, with the sawtooth roof, um, this needs to continually uh, continue to be protected. And if we're not there, um, making sure this is happening, then um, these developers will uh, knock it all down and... Uh, build, in my opinion, um, quite poor amenity um, townhouses. I, uh, I'm not happy to approve this under our heritage overlay, HO472, and I'm quite <coughs> clear that uh, I think we should be sending a, a message um, to uh, the decision makers here that um, you know, we don't want to see our heritage go under any circumstances. But there is a loss of far too much fabric of heritage for my liking. And, um, you know, and there's, we're, we're, we're going to hand back, if we don't, if we don't reject this, um, over 3,000 square metres um, that should be actually saved. There should be a lot more, but that's all we've got up to today um, to potentially um, fight for. So... Councillors, I urge you um, to support this motion. Any other speakers, councillors? I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry? Oh, I, but no one spoke against it. It's, yeah, I know he does, but I'm discouraging it. I just say we should not give an inch on this. It really Thanks. is up to us to uphold what we believe in heritage and fishermen's bent. OK, all those in favour of the refusal? Against? Declare it carried. Can I just explain to the um, people from Hewenden? Um, we've got to go through a few more and then we'll get to you. And I'll make sure you know when we're talking about Hewenden. Good idea. Go for a coffee. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, agenda item six point nine. One, a 15 to 35 Thistlethwaite Street and 1 to 4 Shamrock Place, South Melbourne.
We have uh, one uh, speaker from the public, the applicant, Lloyd Evatt. Well, is sorry, sorry, L Lloyd Elliot, Lloyd Elliot. All show now go. Yeah, Lloyd Elliot. Okay, councillors, there's no um, speaker from the public. Any questions? If I don't have any questions, I'll ask for a um, resolution, a motion. Oh, sorry, Councillor Copsey. You moved it. Move the officer's recommendation. Thanks very much. Councillor Voss is seconding it. Um, Councillor Copsey, do you wish to speak? Councillor Voss, do you wish to speak? Any other councillors? So we have the officer's recommendation. I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare it carried. I'm now mo moving to um, item 6.1, amendment C142, which is a heritage overlay number six, request to seek authorisation to prepare and exhibit an amendment. So we've got five objectors. I'll take them as I, as I see them. Um, Michael and Inga Walton, are you here? Yeah, sorry. So please sit in that seat there and I'll ask you to press the middle button and, um, and say your name first and your suburb second and then please speak to us. I, I, you're not from Hewenden, are you? No, Your Worship. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Inga. Uh, so, Your Worship, uh, councillors and other officials, um, I'm Inga Walton. I live in East St Kilda at 42 Hotham Street, which in your records has been assigned the number um, 2015. Uh, the Heritage Overlay 6 consultation process from May this year is the first time we have ever been informed that Heritage Overlay had been applied to our property at 42 Hotham back in 2006, much less seen the citation number. Furthermore, we have never heard of Amendment C46 nor do we know any of the details of this process or the documentation tabled in support of it. The original overlay on 42 Hotham occurred entirely without our knowledge and with no recourse to us. Until this year, we have never received any notification that such an overlay had ever been applied. Previous to this year, the last communication we received from Port Phillip Council concerning a potential heritage overlay on 42 Hotham was on the 12th of August 2004. In reference to attachment 2, the summary of submissions, we are particularly angered at the, at the officer response section, the note that reads, 
Council's records indicate that the notification of Amendment C46 was sent to the owner of this property and no submission was made at this time. No such letter was ever received by us about this matter. We would like to know if the council records referred to are accessible to the public because we would certainly like to see a copy of this notification, if such exists. It rather beggars belief that we would not have responded about this had we been in receipt of such a communication from Port Phillip Council. Furthermore, we can produce all written correspondence ever received by us from Port Phillip Council in regard to our property and the heritage issues. I note that this is not the first time we have mysteriously not received notification from Port Phillip Council concerning critical proposals relating to heritage issues under consideration and how they might affect our property. Also in the issues raised section of attachment two, there is a strange reference to the last review of HO6 being in 1998. This date is not mentioned in our submission and is an incorrect characterization of the points that we were making. We bought the property in 1999. We actually don't know why this reference is mentioned. The committee in its uh, preambles keeps reiterating that the purpose of HO6 is to, and I quote, enable landowners to provide further information and or seek clarification regarding what is proposed to improve the accuracy of the amendment. Now, in our case, we have certainly provided a substantial further information to Council regarding issues of a very serious nature about the past conduct of Port Phillip Council in regards to our property. We consider this conduct to have been highly improper and it has resulted in us basically being disenfranchised in relation to our property and the decision subsequently adopted without our knowledge. In our view, this should invalidate the overlay altogether, along with the recently proposed amendments to HO6. This was the principal thrust of our submission and the overriding concern with the process. We do not know what evidence was tabled in the original overlay and how that decision was reached by Council at that time. We made eight points that we contend the current citation 2015 fails to demonstrate as to why the overlay exists and these have not been addressed. Amongst the other matters that we have raised in our six page submission, is the incidence of the property suddenly acquiring a name. We have to wind it up shortly. I shall be winding up shortly, Your Worship. Um, we were amazed to see that the property referred to in the David Helms Heritage Planning Report was referred to as Summers House. We know of no such attribution, nor have we seen or been provided with any documentation to explain where this apparently arbitrary designation has come from. We pointed out that this name was not used in the original Gary Peer campaign when we bought the property in 1999, a copy of which we retain, nor is it on the deed of sale. Such a name has never been mentioned to us by the previous owner, Lorraine Wagstaff, whose family has owned the house the longest of all the previous and current occupants. Why is the property still referred to as such in Report Part 2 over our stated objections? It is also noted on page 21 that multiple submitters, including ourselves, expressed concern that the inclusion of their property will affect its value. In the Attachment 2 Officer Responses cites a 10-page Heritage Victoria report of March 2001 that discusses this issue and is partially quoted. However, I do think it is rather disingenuous because it should also be noted, which it is not, that this report looks at other published reports and papers, some of them informal and carrying no apparent official weight, most dating from the 1990s, but one as early as 1987, and that one is from South Australia. One of the report reports concerns Malden in country Victoria, 1992, a shire known for its strict imposition of height and character control of building. 
Another is about Geelong, a Deakin University thesis Ms. by Walton, a student. We, you've had double the time that most people are allocated, so please come to a finish. Well, including, in conclusion, I would simply like to say that we feel the issues raised in our submission have not been adequately reflected or addressed in Attachment 2, and I don't see the relevance of the Heritage Victoria report for properties in inner city Melbourne in 2018. Thanks very much. I just wondered um, if uh, we could, um, is Ms Hodgson or, Ms. or Mr O'Neill would uh, be able to clarify the issues of notification for Ms Walton and also some of the issues in relation to the text cited. Um, through you, Mr and Chairman. And the name. That better? Through you, Mr Chairman. Um, our records from the original C46 planning scheme amendment um, indicate three letters were sent to the property. One from Mr Greg Day, who was then the communication coordinator, um, apologising for, um, amongst other things, an earlier citation that wasn't sent to the property um, uh, in relation to the start of the review of that um, East St Kilda Heritage Precinct back in 2004. A second one of the same day by Miss Sandra Wade, who was the strategic planning coordinator at the time, uh, indicating that council had uh, drafted the East St Kilda Heritage Review and was seeking informal comments to that. And then a further one on the 25th of February 2005, indicating that the amendment was to be exhibited. Um, no submission was lodged in relation to the exhibition letter in 2005. So when the matter was referred to a panel at that time, it was not addressed by the panel and it was adopted and approved. Um, in relation to the origins of the name Summers, um, the house was erected in 1926 by a bricklayer named Harold Summers and that's where the name has come from in the citation. Thank you. Um, the next person on my list is um, George Burnath. My name is George Burnath and I'm the owner of the property at 35 Crimea Street. I thank you for this opportunity and this is the first time that I have ever been involved in anything like this and I'm certainly no expert. So please excuse any mistakes in this submission. This property has been proposed to be regraded as significant, number 35 Crimea Street, in place of the current contributory outside HO, whatever that really means, and it's to be overlay. added to the Heritage Overlay 6. The reason given in the report that I've got, and I quote, this is a Victorian house with Federation additions, relatively intact to Federation era. Comparable integrity to significant houses with heritage overlay six and part of the Crimea Street extension. This property is described as a house, but it's in fact not a house, but a childcare centre, kinder club childcare centre, which has been operating as such for about half a century. Upon being sent this proposed regrading, I, of course, lodged an objection to council on the 19th of June of this year, enclosing photographs to illustrate the many significant alterations and remodelling that have occurred over time to suit the purpose for which this building is being used, which is a childcare centre. And that extends to uh, restumping, underpinning, um, walls moved inside, a uh, new roof to stop it leaking, and so on. The officer duly responded, saying, and I quote again, that the majority of the alterations have been interior renovations or alterations to the rear of the property, which cannot be seen from the street. The Victorian attributes that justify the inclusion of this property as a significant place are still 
relatively intact. The grading of significant is therefore considered appropriate. It is quite clear from this, and again I state I'm no expert, that this justification for the significant regrading is the facade of this building and its facade alone. Substantial alterations and remodelling are being planned for the facade of this building as part of ongoing repair and maintenance. This house originally is 100 years old, more than likely. It's been in our family for in excess of 60 years. So maintenance and repair are unfortunately required. So the repairs and maintenance that are being done is in, is in keeping with a modern childcare centre. These works are scheduled to be carried out in the coming Christmas break because it's a childcare centre, when together with the front fence, the facade will be rendered and painted a uniform cream colour, thus giving it a more modern look that's consistent with the childcare centre that it is. My submission is that once these works have been completed, there will be nothing left of any heritage value to be preserved, neither inside nor outside the building. Accordingly, it is appropriate that this property be regraded as nil. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mr. Burnett. Is uh, Michael Walton here? Excuse me, Michael Walton, uh, Hotham Street, East St Kilda. Well, since my daughter's taken up so much of your time, I'll keep this relatively brief. Um, I suppose our main concern is we have not been receiving these documents, and I don't know why. We've been told that there was a plan to send them, and uh, of course we did not raise an objection because we didn't know it was happening. Now we are. The second thing I would say is, having read the two reports, the early report and the draft new report, <clears throat> uh, it's almost like a cut and paste. There's very, very little new in the, in the second report, and yet for some reason, our property has been upgraded in the heritage listing for what I can see to be no apparent reason. And <clears throat> I would like a reasonable reason uh, the objection was simply because there was no reason. I'm a consulting engineer and I'm used to having people give me a decent reason for doing certain things and as far as I can see from the council I've got, I haven't got that. I haven't been getting the communication, I haven't been getting the right answers. <clears throat> and as for the name of the house, Summer's House, Yes, there probably was a family living there called Summers. So it was the Summers house, as in the house of the Summers. It was not a prestigious building called Summers house, as far as I can see. So anyway, those are my objections. Uh, first of all, I'm not getting decent communication from council. And secondly, I cannot see a good reason why, with the same verbiage in the reports, we get a different result. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I just wondered, uh, Mr O'Neill, if there's anything we could uh, say to uh, help Mr Walton? Through you, Mr Chairman. Um, the original 2006 East uh, St Kilda Heritage Review, that is when it was approved, graded the property as significant. It is um, not proposed to change from being significant in this amendment. It is merely changing from being in a site-specific heritage overlay to being a part of the uh, Alma Road, Murchison Street precinct based overlay. So the significance of the property is not proposed to change as part of this proposal. Thanks very much. Uh, Farai Mufuka. Good afternoon. 
Um, my name is Farai Mufuga. I'm the Director of Business at St. Michael's Grammar School. And I'm sure all the councillors here would know that St. Michael's um, at the moment has a number of heritage listed facilities that we um, take care of at our facility and we actually welcome um, the approach or the process that we've gone through with council. Um, and we also appreciate, I guess, the changes that have been made. Um, the changes that have been made in the updated St. George's Presbyterian Church Citation, which is number 78. The, the implications of which, as we understand them, are that the church and the fence are of primary significance in the local context. The hall um, is of secondary significance, and the, post, and the post-war manse um, is of no significance. From our perspective, it would be helpful if this could be expressly um, stated in the citation that is um, in a similar form to a 1925 building that we actually have on our campus that has recently gone through an updated citation and, and is reflective of that. So from our perspective, that is something that we were hoping could be reflected in the citation more specifically. Thanks very much for that. I mean, uh, yeah. Sorry, is it okay if one of our councillors asks you a question? Of course. Of course. I just want to clarify what you're saying. You're saying um, on the main campus of St Michael's, yes. there are buildings which are individually yes. listed as significant or not significant. Yes. Or so on our main campus, we're in a heritage overlay, the whole campus, currently HO6, which is on 25 Chapel Street. On HO6, we have Heritage Victoria listed facilities which we're very proud to maintain on our campus. And then we've got some local heritage facilities on our campus as well. And some of those have gone through this review of Heritage Overlay 6, and we've actually accepted um, the citations that have been prepared, so we're comfortable with those. The one that we've got an issue with is the St. George's Church, which is on 4 Chapel Street, which is across the road from us. Um, and on and that, that facility itself has... Um, uh, two facilities that are, I guess, in that precinct that are under Heritage Victoria, so listed under Heritage Victoria, which is the fence, the front fence, and the church itself. There is a manse building, which is a post-war facility, um, which has been highlighted as it by Heritage Victoria of no significance. It has no significance. And then there is an old um, um, nursery hall at the back, um, which is um, a facility where we currently house our performing arts um, um, programs at the school, and that is the, the facility that we would want, um, I guess, highlighted appropriately, appropriately in terms of the hierarchy of significance. From our perspective, we feel there's no architectural um, merit um, for it to be highlighted as a building of significance, and in fact, um, we've got a similar building on our main campus, a 1925 building, that we feel is in a similar, similar ilk. But, uh, thank you, but could I just clarify? Yes. The main campus of St Michael's has a general. It's it's it, the whole property is has a heritage local, overlay. A local council heritage overlay. Correct. Within that, there's a heritage Victoria. Correct. With some of the buildings. Yeah, for some of for some of them, and the, the same on your St George's property. It's got a, it's the whole property is given heritage protection from council, and in the middle of it there is a uh, well, there, plus the fence there is a heritage Victoria citation in the middle. So in what way is it the case different? Um, that's what we're trying also maybe just to re-clarify. So on the St. George's facility we have the church, which is a Heritage Victoria listed facility and also sits within the overlay. Next to the church there is a post-war manse, which is again in the local council overlay, but is not listed um, by Heritage Victoria is a significant building. And in fact, they've highlighted that there is no significance of that facility. And behind those two facilities, there is an old, um, I guess, nursery school building, which is, the, which is the building that, I guess, for us is contentious. Um, it is an old building that has no real ar architectural significance from our perspective. And I guess when you look at the hierarchy um, for significance, we don't feel that it deserves to be highlighted as a significant building. I'll take up your question with the officers. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much. You can sit down now. Do you want to take that up, Councillor Brad? Is that, that's, yes. Um, are we doing it case by case, are we? Yeah, okay. okay. 
Um, I, I would just like officers to clarify the situation with, um, I guess, the, the, the meaning of having a, a, a council uh, heritage grading over an entire property vis-à-vis -vis the, um, the status of individual structures on that property. Through you, Mr Chairman. Um, it's common for um, a property, a whole property, to have a heritage overlay, but only some components of that site to be um, stated in the uh, statement of the significance of as to what is significant. And I believe that's what the gentleman is speaking to about how that, that those matters are described in the in the statement of the significance that's proposed. Um, there is also Victorian Heritage Register listed elements on these properties as well. So there's a lot of old buildings in in, in the complex. Um, uh, we have um, offered to meet with the, the school to understand their concerns in more detail and have it referred to our heritage advisor for consideration. Um, at the date of writing this report, um, that hadn't been taken up. It now has been. We're due to meet with them next week. Um, uh, I would say that um, the next step in this process, should Council agree to move forward, would be to formally exhibit the proposal and seek, and seek um, public submissions through the planning scheme amendment process. Um, uh, should that process um, uh, result in changes that were either agreed by Council or, or um, indeed um, proposed by a panel, they could be considered when Council uh, made a decision as to whether to adopt the amendment or not. Um, so I think there's already perhaps a process in train to kind of um, see that through and that's indeed what the process of exhibiting a planning scheme amendment is for. What's happened in this case, which is normal, for council when it undertakes large planning scheme amendments is to do an informal consultation first, just to see if any, um, are there are any issues or errors that we need to resolve, um, uh, which um, this, this process has led to today. So uh, I would say that there's a further opportunity to kind of work with the school to see how we can clarify the statement of significance. In, indeed, there's further opportunity to work with all of the objectors. That's correct. All, all of the objectors, that's correct. Is it a question? Okay, um, but just in general terms, uh, a building on on a property which is which has a heritage protection on it, if it isn't specifically mentioned in the statement of significant significance of being significant itself, there is usually no particular uh, problem with uh, altering it or demolishing it. With but you just need council permission. That's all. Um, through you, Mr Chairman, that's, that's correct um, in general terms, but I think it's also worth pointing out that the presence of other um, significant um, elements of heritage on the property may impact on how um, other parts of the site are developed in terms of you know, making sure it's a sympathetic design, it doesn't you know, um, impact on what is significant on the site, but that's true. A permit can be issued under the heritage overlay. Let's move on to the next objector. Uh, is it Mina Esther Gordon? My husband, I'm going to try to start again. Okay, my name is Minna Esther Gordon, and I am from 44 Hotham Street, East St. Kilda. My husband and I came to this suburb in 1979. We have been living in this house for 30 years. We've raised our children here. Our home is our, own, our ma only major asset. No, let me take that back. My children are our, our major asset, but our home is our only major financial asset. I have Parkinson's disease for the last 18 years. My husband is close to retirement. Our property, our property was not designated as heritage listing, listed until this year. We are afraid that the heritage designation will affect the resale value of our property. The response we, we received when we wrote this in, in, into the uh, Strategic Planning Committee um, was, the, was that they gave us examples, uh, they gave us a report, the proof from a report that was 17 years old and cited places overseas or country towns. 
I think that the situation here in East St. Kilda or Melbourne in general is quite different than it was 17 years ago and quite different than it would be in country towns or overseas. So I don't think that proves anything. We have seen that in reality nothing stops the developers, and as soon as they get their hands on a property, they go the VCAT, they, 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 they don't really, um, they, they fight the council designations, whatever it is, and they, many times they get their way. So what's the point of this whole overlay? It only makes it difficult for the, for the present owners. I sent two letters when we, said, when we were asked to submit our comments. The attachment to summary of submissions received during consultation and officer, officer responses does not even address my submission. I don't know if they just left me out because I don't count or if they left me out because they accidentally might have um, exchange, made a mistake and exchanged my property for a different property because there was a response there for property at 40 Hatham Street and I asked the owner who said that he never wrote anything in. So I don't know what's going on over there. Anyway, I also found it was very difficult to get, to get information on this meeting because when I tried the link that was given in the letter, in the email, it did not work. I had to type in every, every letter until I got the right link. Something's wrong, something's going wrong over here. And when, and when I called up to find out more, there was the kind receptionist who told, to, to told me that she would, um, she would, transfer my call to the strategic planning uh, people, and I just kept getting, I was on hold with the recording about how you could have your say over and over again. So that's why I'm having my say right now. The council, in my opinion, the council should be focusing on what is best for their constituents who voted them in. The residents and the properties, uh, property owners, uh, us little guys, we are the ones that, that, that are looking to you to make this make this neighborhood uh, good for the people who live here. One more thing I want to mention is that I'm Jewish and I belong to the Jewish community here. The Jewish community here is, is, it has its roots here. We have our infrastructure here. We've got schools, we've got synagogues. We can't just pick up and move to another suburb. We have to stay here. So, we, so we've got to make it good for us. And, you know, it, it, it makes it, it's a stable, it makes it a stable community, it makes it a strong community, it makes it a, a friendly community. But it, it's up to you people to make sure that you have the, the whole community in mind, all the residents and the property owners, and that's what's most important. Thank you very much. Oh, I also have, I have a copy of the two letters that I wrote to the council, which I could give you to you if, you, if you'd like. That'd be great. If you could um, just leave them there and we'll pick them up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mrs. Gordon. Um, I too am Jewish and understand the geographic limits of a Jewish community has to be near its infrastructure and synagogues. Um, Jean Walton. Good evening. I'm a neighbour of Mrs Gordon. We live next door. I think that Mrs Gordon's property has been confused with another and lots of communications seem to go amiss. Um, I've lived, I've been a ratepayer here for 36 years and um, yeah, I just wonder why suddenly we're in this situation. We are not told, you know, the dog ate my homework, we don't get communications. And frankly, as a ratepayer, this is the first time at a council meeting, my daughter was speaking for too long. I couldn't hear this gentleman here. I couldn't hear most of what was being said. Um, Look, I, I, I apologise for consider, that. I would consider that waffling and frankly, when I'm looking at the decision making in this council, I just think, well, why? Also a question, who are these heritage people that you have employed? And how much are we paying for it? Is that under freedom of information or are you all sitting there like that? Um, and just bank of taxpayer, bank of ratepayer, and rates are going up, 
per income stay the same? And we're looking at what are we looking at? I'll, I'll ask a clarifying question on that. Okay. When you're finished. When I've finished. When you're finished. I'll, I'll no, ask no, a question. No, no, I'm finished. Oh, okay. I'm so finished. Thanks very much, Mrs. Walton. Thank you. And um, can I say to Mrs. Gordon, I really apologise about that phone call where you were left hanging. That's unacceptable. Could I ask for some clarification about our consultant and uh, who the consultant is? The consultant that was commissioned to do the um, East St Kilda Heritage Review that's the subject of the meeting tonight is David Helms Heritage Planning. Who's a member of staff, or uh, was a member of staff? He's not a member of staff, no. Um, that's all the objectives we have. Councillors, do you have any questions? Do we have any resolutions? Councillor Brand. Yes, I wanted... Um I, just, I, I guess I want to uh, ask what is, the, what, what is the actual process of notifying uh, con, uh, con, uh, citizens by letter in, in, these, uh, in the case of studies like this? Through Mr Chairman, the process for notifying um, affected um, landowners is to um, undertake a mail merge of all of the properties that are nominated as being affected in our GIS database and then it gets sent to where the rates notices get sent to. And if I can just add to that response through you, Mr Chair, um, just to say that Council is committed to providing good customer service and a great customer experience. Our records did show that uh, correspondence was sent. We will review that and give you copies um, as per your request. Uh, and we are um, looking and investing significantly into improving the customer experience. So thank you for your feedback. Do we have a, a sort of a, any idea of a failure rate on, on uh, the delivery of notices? Is that something which we can ever collect? Through you, Mr Chair, I don't have that information on me at the moment. It, from my experience working in local government, which is more than 20 years, it can happen. Um, in, fortunately, in this situation, we have copies we can provide, and as well as that, if Council endorses um, the, council, uh, the recommendation, there is a, actually a formal process that will be undertaken where we'll make doubly sure that all relevant property owners are notified, and including the objectors here tonight. Excuse me, your time's finished, please. Thank you. Councillor Brand? No, no, Councillor Voss? Just wondering, um, Mayor, if I could ask a question about what opportunities still remain. Um, if we um, pass the recommendation that's here tonight for any further changes, um, given some of the feedback that we've heard. Through you, Mr Chairman. Um, the process from here, if you adopt the recommendation tonight, is that um, a letter will be sent... Uh, well, first of all, the, the, um, a letter will be sent to the Minister for Planning requesting his authorisation to prepare and exhibit a planning scheme amendment under the Planning Environment Act. At that point, we will formally notify all the landowners and say, if you wish to make a submission, please do so. The period for that is usually approximately one month. After that, um, all of the submissions will come back to Council and Council will um, form a preliminary position on those so that Council officers are able to take that position to a, um, an independent panel. An independent panel is a panel of experts appointed by the Minister for Planning to consider planning matters when they're in dispute as part of a planning scheme amendment, all of those submitters can then be heard at that panel hearing. The panel um, will then give council a report of recommendations and then the, the council can then make a decision about what it wants to do with the amendment at that stage and that includes the options of um, approving it as it was exhibited, 
approving it with changes to align with recommendations from the panel or abandoning the whole amendment. They are the options at the time. So, um, Councillor Brand, you're prepared to move. Do I have a seconder? Seconded, Councillor Voss. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Brand? Yes, I would. Um, doing a, a, a heritage amendment like this is a huge job. It takes an enormous amount of time. And there are a couple of reasons why it takes so much time. One is it is a, it is a, it is a painstaking task for anybody to do. And David Helms, who is our consultant on this, is a, an extraordinarily um, uh, thorough and experienced and uh, uh, consultant in these matters of very, very high reputation. Uh, and he has done an incredible job from what I have seen looking through and, and watching this uh, amendment um, emerge. The other, it is a huge job. I can't believe that one single human can even do it. Um, the other reason is because we go through so many processes uh, and you're in the middle of this process now and the process is a process as much as anything of safety nets and opportunity to have your say and uh, if there's one thing which has gone wrong, you have missed an early letter for some reason but you have obviously got a letter since then and you are here with an opportunity to put your, um, your uh, uh, case to us, which is great, and we're hearing that. And what we're moving to do today is to put the whole new uh, amendment on exhibition so that the public can actually see it again in public and make comment on it. And your comments will then be taken into, into regard, for instance, if you dispute the heritage rating of your property. It'll be assessed not just by the council officer, but by an independent panel member that would actually, that will, that will assess that as well. And then it'll come back to council and then it goes to the minister. It's, it's a huge, long drawn out bureaucratic process to make sure that everybody has, had a, everybody has had a fair say and a fair go and nothing has been missed. So that's, we're just in the, we're in the, in one of the early stages of this process right now, and it's good that you're here, telling us of the problems that you have, and it'll be take it'll be listened to through the process, and a decision will be eventually made. Uh, anyway, I'm happy to get on with this part. Councillor Voss, I don't have any further thing anything to add to that. Does anyone else wish to add? Councillor Bond, um, I think it was mentioned by one of the speakers that you know. We, we continually go to VCAT and lose against developers who wish to develop these large buildings on their sites. One of the reasons we do studies such as this is so that when we go to VCAT, we have in place uh, proper heritage reports, proper heritage information and citations so that we can put a counter argument to VCAT um, in order to, to justify decisions we make against uh, the, the, the blanket demolition or the blanket removal of, of heritage properties, the properties that people who live in these neighbourhoods consider important to them. Um, it's often the cases that get highlighted as where we go to VCAT and lose, it's often because we don't have heritage uh, citations and heritage reports such as this in place. And the two examples recently are the, the Greyhound and the, the London in Port Melbourne where you know, for some reason those two properties weren't in the heritage overlays for those particular areas and the developer was allowed to, to demolish those particular properties. Um, had we had a report like this which covered those particular properties in place, the, the, the outcome there may have been different. Um, it's no guarantee that it will create a different outcome, but what it will do is give us the basis on which to form an argument that these properties need to be to be retained, and so that we can protect some of our neighbourhoods from the the overdevelopment we all we all see and we all you know, don't often agree with in the various neighbourhoods of Port Phillip. So, thank you to the officers for for doing this work. Um, it, it will come in handy at some point in time in the future when various applications are made for these various properties and people wish to, to develop them, um, we can rely on these, this information to, to form part of Council's argument to 
argue for the re retention of the existing property. Any other? Thanks very much, Councillor Bond. Any other? I might add a few words just to reiterate what Councillor Brand said, that this is a long, exhaustive process and this isn't the final nail in the coffin. Secondly, I'd like to reiterate what Councillor Bond said, is that we, you know, heritage, preservation of heritage is an important uh, value of this community and it's a value that this council proudly promotes. And one of the ways we promote it is to do these slow, considered studies of the heritage nature of our built form. And finally, you know, every, every, I own two properties, they're both in heritage overlay zones, and everyone fears that there's a loss of value. No one can promise you what will happen to the value of your house. The only thing I can say by way of consolation is I've been here 40 years. In those 40 years, the heritage protections have increased a lot, significantly, tangibly. And also in that time, the prices of the property has risen inexorably. And just my anecdotal evidence, my gut feeling is that heritage, though it adds to the inconvenience of some, on some properties, has had no impact on the, what I see as the inexorable rise of values of properties in the city of Port Phillip. I hope that's some consolation. Councillor Brand, do you wish to close? I just want to disagree with you slightly on it. I believe that, um, that uh, heritage protection is actually underpins uh, property values in this, in this city and that people are, people are desperately wanting to live in this city because of its beauty and its amenity, uh, which is largely protected by heritage. Um, uh, heritage uh, um, uh, provisions, and um, I think it's a remarkable thing. Apart from that, I agree with everything else, and I will shut up. Thanks very much for that clarification. I, th I think you're correct. Um, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. OK, we'll now move on to 6.2, Amendment C157, Extension of Interim Heritage Controls, Fisherman's Bend Heritage Area. There are no speakers. Thanks very much for coming tonight, though. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> so, um, OK, um, there's no speakers. Councillors, do you have any questions? Do you have any motions or resolutions? Oh, Councillor Copsey? I can't hear you, but I suspect that you're removing the officer's recommendation. recommendation, yep. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss? Councillor Copsey? Councillor Voss? I just think it's a no-brainer. We all should support this. <laughs> I've heard that said before. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, Councillor Brand? I think, well, I'm basically agreeing with uh, Councillor Voss, but um, these particular properties around on the edge of Montague, I think the edge of Montague is a particularly important part of the city. Montague itself is undergoing cataclysmic change, but I think... We can still possibly perceive it as a as a as a village and a community, largely by reading its external sort of shell of of, of the old terraces and the old buildings. And I just it's a really crucial part of keeping the sense of the of the the history and the grain of Montague, as especially around these parts that sort of make it legible to us. So I'm very much in favour of it. Good on you. Well spoken, Councillor Brand. Um, any other? Do you wish to close? Oh, but Councillor Pearl, sorry. 
I'm mad about Montague, as you all know. So there's some good photos downstairs in the corridor at the moment of what those uh, what those streets look like where there was almost 12,500 people living in that zone. So it's a very important precinct and I wholeheartedly support this and would encourage everybody to go and have a look in the corridor at those photos that are currently there uh, to give you a glimpse back at how vibrant that community there once was. Thanks very much. Councillor Copsey, do you wish to close? I move the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. 6.3, 3 Rainsford Street, Elwood. We have um, two uh, members of the community who wish to speak. First, a supporter, Dana Thani. Good evening, councillors. Hi. Mayor, how are you? Good. Good to see you again. <laughs> uh, my name is Dana Thane. I'm from Brighton Road, Elwood. Uh, in relation to the Phoenix Kareniensis or the Canary Island date palm at number three, Rainsford Street, Elwood, uh, I'd be happy, I'm happy with uh, the proposer, proposal of the developer to uh, retain the tree, uh, to protect the tree uh, whilst uh, construction processes are going on. Uh, I also spoke to David Helms and there, there is a heritage concern in general with number three, Rains well with Rainsford Street Precinct in general. Uh, I don't think it has had any uh, heritage overlay uh, inspection. It's a small street. It's not actually, it, actually it's not a street. It's like a laneway. Uh, it's a very small street and there are other proposed developments there. And I tend to suggest that uh, this street has not been part of the heritage overlay process of uh, the city of Port Phillip and I would suggest that that's a, an oversight on behalf of that uh, heritage process. I'm happy, I'm grateful to you all for uh, saving the tree. Uh, I'm happy, I'm not happy that the building's coming down, uh, but I'm happy to save the tree because it's a very, very important part of that street. Um, that tree makes the street if other developments go up, it, it will be the shining beacon of that street um, because they're proposing another, another four apartments across the road from there. Um, so without the tree, it would be very, very bleak. So I'm grateful to council. I'm grateful to the uh, statutory planning department for putting in all the work. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to save the tree and I'm glad that was the outcome that we've achieved. So thank you very much. Good on you, thanks very much. Uh, Mark Chester, the app for the applicant. Is that on? It is. It is. Um, good evening, my name is Mark Chester. I represent the permit applicant in this matter. Um, I wasn't actually involved on the original plans and I certainly didn't present at the last committee meeting, but I did happen to watch what was a, a pretty in-depth discussion um, streamed over the internet about this particular tree and the intentions of the committee to try and do everything we can to retain it. Um, the, Initial approach was to try and move the tree, but in doing so, move it on the site would result in some impact on the power lines. The second option was to retain the tree in its current position with the proposed conditions in the officer's report, but that would have had a fairly detrimental impact on townhouse one. And we're talking um, perhaps resulting in a three-storey single, um, a one-bedroom townhouse that um, for obvious reasons 
probably is not what the community is after and certainly not what the applicant was looking to achieve. This is one of those situations where if we're able to increase or reduce the side setback as was initially proposed in the application drawings, then this is an example of that sort of balancing approach, I think, where the key was to retain the tree. The key was to, for the applicant was obviously also to retain the tree but maintain four townhouses. From the council's perspective, they're also interested in maintaining amenity and neighbourhood character. And we would say that the proposed side setback of 1.5 metres is, and you can see fairly well on that drawing there, just the sort of proximity of the dwelling, the adjacent dwelling, that neighbourhood character I don't think is in dispute. And I think just based on the position of windows and the like that um, amenity is not really in dispute. So I think that this is a great example of, dare I say, give, given, a give and take type approach where we get to retain the tree, achieve a good outcome from a planning perspective and sort of everybody hopefully wins. Um, the last thing I would say is when I looked at, when I reviewed the, um, the last committee meeting, I, I don't recall who it was, but I think it, someone raised the issue of the current proposal in the officer report is to relocate the tree from this particular site to a council park being an asset of the council. And someone, I think, raised this question as perhaps being a, a grey area. I'd say the other benefit of this proposal is that we don't need to examine, at least today, Oh, well, we'll save it for another application, I suppose, if that's the sort of pathway that the council want to go down in these sort of situations where trees are removed. So I think the council wins, I think the process wins, I think the applicant wins, and I think the neighbour wins. So hopefully this is a victory for all. Thanks very much. So just to clarify, you're happy with the officer's current recommendation? With the, re with the alteration of the side, uh, the condition 1A that requires a side setback to 2.4 metres, that, that just can't, can't be achieved and maintain that townhouse one in any meaningful form. And even if it was to be, the staircase was to be relocated like townhouse two and townhouse three, it, it simply would a lot of time between the last committee meeting and this one was spent on, on these plans to try and get them to where they are. So hopefully we can see mutual benefit here. Thanks very much. Cool. Um, uh, look, just on a, a very minor question, but I notice uh, the difference between uh, both of the, the, the before and after plans, that there's a, in the before ones, there's actually a very large window on the top corner of the side elevation yeah. and it's disappeared again, uh, disappeared into a little slot. Is there I any have, good I reason have, for that? I have seen that. I, Rightfully or wrongly, I can say that was an oversight just in the rush to get plans to the planning officer who needed to c circulate it within the plan department and get it to you guys before the meeting. That just dropped off or was amended, but more than happy with the original scale window of the what, we, what are the current plans? Because these are just proposed. The current plans that were before you in the last meeting are, as I understand it, the plans that the planning department will be reviewing when they're looking to endorse it. So that, that window's there. That's, that's good. I mean, it does, it does seem to me to be actually a rem have a remarkable effect, uh, effect on the neighbourhood, on the character of the I, building for some I, reason. I have yeah. to agree. I think you're right. I ask Councillor Brand, are you sort of working on an amendment in your head? Councillor Brand? Okay, from the officers. From the officers, if I could ask the officers, if the, if the um, window is still, you haven't asked for the, we haven't asked for the window to be reduced in size. We have been, rec we've received plans that have it reduced in size, but we haven't asked for it. So. If final plans came back with it, back to its original size, would there be a problem? Was there a need to amend anything at this point? You're quite right. After you, Mr Chairman, you're quite 
right, Councillor, there's no need for... The, the, the window is, is there and will remain there. The, there's no conditions on the permit that require the deletion of that window. Great. OK. There was another question I saw. That was Councillor my question. Voss? It was to clarify whether we needed any conditions to okay. make sure that popped back in. Thanks very much, Mr Chester. That's fine. Councillors, questions of the officers? Oh, OK. So um, have you got a question or alternative? OK, question. I'd just like to ask the officers, the, the, one, the one major thing is that has been requested by the applicant to accommodate the tree is on the top floor of the front apartment being moved out by... I'm afraid I just haven't reviewed the figures here, but it looks like about eight, about 700 mils or something or other um, towards the property next door. I'm just wondering, what, how do you assess the impact of that? What is the impact? What impact does it have? Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, that's my question. Through you, Mr Chairman. The purpose of that condition in the first instance was threefold. The, the, the condition came about, um, a part of the reason that the condition came about was through the advice of Council's Urban Design Advisor, who was critical of the, um, the I suppose, awkward projection of that stairwell at the, at the second floor. The other, <coughs> excuse me, the other reasons for that condition being recommended was in terms of a, a, um, a response to the separation between buildings, so a, a neighbourhood character response. And the third reason um, behind that condition was to improve the sunlight access to, in, in particular, the front balconies of the neighbouring property at number five, Rainsford Street. The side balconies towards the front. That's correct. And can you have you quantified the effect in any way that they would of how they'd be affected by the extra? How much is, how much are we asking them to set it back? We're requesting it to be set back the same as the remainder of the building, which is, as you say, um, what's about it's about point point eight of a metre from one point. So I just refer to the plans from 1.6 to 2.4. And just just trying to sort of round out my idea of what's being asked here, if if we insisted on that, and then they said, well, can we try something else and push even further towards the front? How would we feel about re, re, redistributing the same? Well, that'll be hard, wouldn't it? But redistributing the same or some. Redistributing the areas of area of uh, unit one, or the front unit, sort of uh, further forward rather than further sideways. That could be a possibility, councillor. Um, again, it would be something that I would probably take back to the urban designers for some for some advice on. Any further questions? We've got a, an alternative um, uh, recommendation to be moved by Councillor Crawford. Councillor Crawford, could I just ask you to read the new, the new 3.31A? It's in, it's... Uh, so the new 3.31A uh, uh, would read reduction in the east side boundary setback of the second floor stair of unit one, which projects forwards of the master bedroom to a minimum of 7.6 metres and a consequential reconfiguration of the internal layout. Great. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconded Councillor Copsey. Councillor Crawford, do you wish to speak? Look, I'm, I'm um, putting forward this alternative motion because I do think there was, at the last planning meeting, a lot of love for the tree to remain. And I think that 
the um, applicant has done the right thing. You know, so often we ask for things that we don't get, and I know there were some good negotiations that went on from both sides. And I do think that it, um, in order to keep that tree, um, which would be viewed by the whole street and keep the character, you know, add to the amenity of the area, that giving 700 mil on one side of the um, already um, an area that has close boundary um, reach between the apartments, I think is a fair compromise. I think we can't just take and not give. So I think, you know, I would encourage for future reference, it would be great if applicants, we can find a good resolution for everyone. Councillor Copsey. Does it, uh, yes, Councillor Pearl. Uh, councillors have, have a, a good amount of time to consider this one, given it's effectively come to us twice, albeit with some amendments. Um, I, I didn't support it uh, before on the basis that I still think the property behind the tree has heritage value attached to it and I'll remain consistent to that decision. I won't try and convince you otherwise because you've all had more than enough um, time to consider this decision for yourself, but I thought I'd just put that on the record. Councillor Brand? I think I'm leaning towards supporting um, Councillor Crawford on this. I think it has been a very successful negotiation. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that we've managed to save that tree, and that's largely on the willingness of the applicant to go back and retry it. And I, I have actually, <laughs> I've actually looked at that apartment myself and tried to replan it. And I think there are ways of doing it, but they all end up at the same size. Um, and I'm, uh, I just. I think in terms of the, if the major issue is a neighbourhood character, both the appearance of it itself and the the sort of separations of buildings in this area, I, I just don't think that um, I don't think that counts in this case at all because we've made huge strides in neighbourhood character of, of saving the tree. In terms of the amenity of the person, the two or two people probably affected next door with a slightly closer to their balcony. Boy, they're still, it's, it, the whole thing is cramped for them and I think that they're getting their main light and amenity from the front and I hope they, uh, they'll be slightly affected, but I hope they enjoy the palm tree in their street. Any further question, um, comments? Councillor Crawford, do you wish to close? I move to the vote. All those in favour? Uh, against? Clearly carried. Can we now move on to 6.424 Tennyson Street, Elwood? We have uh, two speakers, Lenny Magdalena de Vries, objector. Hi. Um, excuse me, I'm slightly new to this. Um, I was told by one of your staff on the phone that I could bring a, a diagram to illustrate my argument and then Great. I can hand that out to you, is that correct? Yep, please, uh, Thank thanks Murray. So my name is Lenny de Vries, um, I live in 14 Hennessy Avenue which is the old Sherwood Hall mansion which was built by the Syme family uh, back in 1892. So, um, as you can see from the diagram, um, the building in question, the rear of 24 Tennyson Street, is uh, the, the building with the yellow star, which is um, in a U-shaped form. Now, the strange thing is that I have, as a resident of the building, of the Sherwood Hall building, the, the one opposite the yellow star, is that um, from our experience over the past two years, and I'm also speaking on behalf of my uh, neighbours in the building, uh, it has created a strange um, amphitheatre sort of effect, how the sound travels. Because of the U-shape, it sort of projects the noise out, and then um, there's a, a shared backyard with 26 Tennyson Street, um, and it, because the sound is locked in by the building surrounding it, it is for whatever strange reason, very loud. So we can hear people's exact conversations from the building of 24 Tennyson Street, um, as it is at the moment. So 
uh, my concern is that a third level will kind of create an even stronger acoustics in that way. Um, as I'm sure you're aware from the documents, the last two years uh, it has been leased out as a backpackers, short-term backpackers place. I'm not here to talk about that. It was horrendous. Um, it really affected our health. Um, the fact that that is in cha the change is in motion um, is 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 hopefully going to happen soon, which is great. I understand that the owner wants to make 17 apartments instead of 20. The fact is, though, that a third level, um, it's just the noise traveling. So even if there's two people sitting outside, whether that's 17 or 20 apartments, it is the, the noise that really affects us. The other issue is, is that there are only, from the looking at the plans, six car parks in front of the building. So there's just a laneway that goes from Tennyson Street past the front building to the back building. And the concern is to the car noises, again, with the amphitheater effect, it travels across. Um, so when you have residents driving up and down that laneway, seeing, oh, is there a car park? Oh, they're all taken. I have to reverse out again. If that happens several times a day and at night, it is uh, of great effect. Finally, um, just aesthetically, uh, the building at the moment has beautiful um, terracotta tiles, which is very much, as you can see from the photo, the surrounding buildings. Um, it's, it's a ca characteristic, I would say, uh, of Elwood. Um, so in the current plan, it's going to be, the third level will be a flat roof, services on top of that. Um, it takes away that beautiful terracotta tiled um, feeling of the neighbourhood, which would be a shame to, to see go. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll take up some of those questions later. Um, Morgan Baston. Um, who specialises in car parking, which I think may be a topical issue tonight. So from a planning perspective, I just want to deal with the noise. First of all, my client isn't the operator of the backpackers that has been the cause of a lot of the noise complaints from this um, site. Uh, not only is the council, but also my client currently in legal proceedings to evict the backpacker operation from this site. Um, so we're working hand in hand with the council to try to resolve this existing problem. And I expect that a lot of the concerns that the objector just raised in terms of noise has been generated by the backpackers and the short term stay that's been currently operating from the site. So collectively, we hope that we can in short term evict the backpackers operation. Um, just in terms of the noise, um, it, the objector's property is one lot removed from the subject site. It's a distance of 24 or 5 metres away from the common boundary of the subject site. So there is another lot between the objector and my client's site. Uh, it clearly is an inner city um, living environment. There are a lot of multi-unit developments in this immediate area of the subject site. The transfer of noise, I expect, is part of that inner, liver, inner city living environs. Um, you would note from the officer's report, which is in support of the proposal, that a, an entire floor has been taken off since this was last put to the council. And the current top floor only has two balconies that are orientated towards this courtyard or internal area. The rest of the top floor is habitable space with windows, not a high degree of open balconies. In relation to the car parking, the current provision is seven spaces in this back area, and we're proposing to reduce that by six. So I'm hoping that, in part, that also reduces the noise issues that the objector raised about traffic. 
So just with that statement, um, I'd like to introduce Brett Young from Ratio, who is a director um, and specialises in car parking and traffic movements. Thank you. Mr Young, could you say your name and suburb for the record, please? Hey, my name's Brett Young. I'm from Ratio Consultants, and we operate out of um, Cremorne. Thank you, councillors. Uh, the key issue in question, is, as I understand it, is the acceptability of the parking provision associated with the proposal. Um, my firm prepared the traffic impact assessment uh, for the application, and since that time, there has been a reduction to the proposed dwelling numbers uh, from 28 in total down to 25 through, through the reduction in the, the top level there. There's also been an increase in parking from 13 to 14 spaces. As a result of these amendments, I can tell you that the um, reduction in parking sought against the planning scheme requirements is actually less than the existing reduction associated with the existing dwellings on the site. And to explain that further, if you take the existing 28 dwellings, the statutory requirement is 28 resident spaces, noting that there's no longer a visitor requirement for the development given the introduction of the PPTN area under VC148. Now, the existing plans show 20 spaces on the, on the existing site plan, and I can tell you, as per the, the officer report, that some of those spaces are substandard, so there aren't really 20 spaces provided in connection with the existing use. It's actually 16 spaces, in, in my view, and assessing against the, the planning scheme requirements. So it's eight spaces in the front, not 11, you can only get eight functional spaces. There's two along the side and six at the rear and, and not seven. So really there's 16 spaces provided there now that are actually functional in connection with the existing 28 dwellings. Therefore, there's a, an existing reduction or an existing deficiency associated with that existing use of 12 spaces. With the proposed amendments, there's now 25 dwellings with 14 car parking spaces provided on site. So that's a reduction of 11 spaces, which again, to my earlier comment, is, is one space less than the existing deficiency associated with the existing use. Um, on, on that basis alone, um, the proposed parking provision should be found acceptable in, in my view. Notwithstanding that, the site is also very well located with respect to public transport outcome uh, options. You've got the Balaclava, Balaclava Rain, uh, excuse me, the Balaclava Railway Station, which is accessible either by a, a, about a ten-minute walk or by tram. You've got uh, four tram options um, and five bus options within walking distance. There's a multitude of public transport options available. So, if you don't own a car, there there are plenty of options available. In addition, there's a number of car share spaces nearby as well, should you need a, a resident need to use a car from time to time. And furthermore, there are 12 bicycle parking spaces pro, uh, proposed as part of the development. Now, that's, there's actually no requirement to provide any bicycle parking there's because of the building height, so the 12 spaces provided are well over and above the statutory requirement. I note that there's a proposed condition by council for one bicycle space to be provided for each apartment, or each dwelling rather, and, and, and that's, that's a good outcome and can be, can be incorporated into the design. It's also a great area for pedestrians and it's supportive of walking as a travel mode. The site actually scores a, a 90 out of a possible 100 and the, the walk score uh, that can be found on walkscore.com. Uh, that means that the site is, um, it's a score based on walking distance to um, amenities such as public transport and shopping and supermarkets and the like, and that's due to the site's proximity to destinations such as the Ackland Street Activity Centre and the Carlisle Street Activity Centre, which you can get to by bike or, or, or walk. So in my view, these attributes are supportive of life without a car. And in conjunction with my earlier remarks regarding the reduction being no less than the existing site, the proposed parking provision associated with the proposal is acceptable in my view. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr Young. 
That'll be fine, thanks. Um, councillors, any questions? I'll start off, uh, Mr Beer. Um, I thought that um, Ms De Vries made a really good point about the, um, the materials to be used on the roof, even though it was to be flat rather than sloping. I just wondered what your comments were on that. Through you, Mr Chair, I'll, I'll answer that question. Thank you. Um, so we obviously have character policies in the planning scheme which direct us to consider what materials are being proposed. Because this building is in the rear part of the site, um, the roof will actually have very limited visibility from the street or the public realm. So while it would certainly be seen from some of the surrounding apartment buildings, which are more than single storey in height, it would have very minimal visibility from the street. In addition, the front part of the site, the front building, is covered by a heritage overlay, um, which is quite important when considering roof materials. However, the rear portion of the site where this building is located is not located in the heritage overlay. So for those reasons, um, we're comfortable that the materiality of the roof and the form of the roof being a flat roof being different to what's there is, is acceptable in, from a character point of view. Thanks very much. Councillor Brand? Thank you. Uh, just to follow that line of questioning, um, just first of all, how can a property be half in a heritage overlay and half not? I'm off the top through you, Mr Chair. Um, I'm not familiar with the history of this particular heritage overlay. It's part of a precinct, so it's part of a Greater Elwood precinct. Um, because it is such a deep property, the heritage overlay actually does cover the whole of some of the properties in the street, but then it, because some of the properties are so deep, it cuts half of the properties. It, it, the alignment of the overlay is actually pretty much in line with the two buildings. So in this case, it, it still results in a fairly, um, in a, an understandable outcome. The older, the, sorry, the front building which is captured is actually the older building of the two as well. And it, it does um, have a, as I understand it, a greater contribution to be made to the precinct as well. So it, it does make sense in its application on this site. Um. I suppose there's no remedy for that. It is. A, it, it seems like a very weird anomaly, uh, and it's, it is. It is um, pertinent here. I don't see how it's going to be fixed, but it's pertinent here because um, I, I, I can actually. I actually know the property that uh, Ms. De Vries, uh, De Vries is, is speaking from. I have had a friend, friends there, um, and I know that view across there. It's. It is. There, there are two things about it which I want to ask you about what can be done. One is that is it a very unusual acoustic thing. I remember just standing out the back of the Syme building and it, is, it feels like you can hear a pin drop. And I think when somebody drops a pin, you can hear it. And it's, it, is actually quite, <laughs> it is actually something special there. And I think also, when I think about standing there and listening to that silence in there, it's generated somehow, I don't know how, that I do remember looking across the, the, the treetops and seeing beautiful tiled roofs. So I think even though this is actually, um, a, 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 I suppose, a visual amenity from a private property, which is actually, as, uh, as one of the other speakers has said, is two properties away, I, I would just like to confirm or be enlightened about any, anything that can be done to influence that from that from the position of uh, Mr. Rees over in uh, Hennessy Avenue. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, can I ask to clarify: Are you talking in relation to the noise or in relation to the appearance? Uh, both, either and both. Thank you. So, through you, Mr. Chair, in relation to the noise, first of all, there's no policy in the planning scheme which specifically allows us to consider noise generated by either the occupants or by the built form. Um, because this is a wholly residential area and because the use that's proposed, which is dwellings, is as of right in the residential zone. So 
Um, certainly, Council is very familiar with the ongoing noise issues with this site, um, but there's nothing in the planning policy that allows us to take that into consideration and, and for instance, the, the form that is proposed. In relation to the appearances viewed from the other properties, the planning policy is not so strong in relation to considering views from private property and the policy around our character is um, often more about how it appears from the street, um, which, has in, which is what has informed our position here as well. So um, yeah, that's probably all I can say on that. Thank you. So given that we can't, um, in the poll, um, planning what we're here tonight, we can't um, consider sound, um, is there any avenue for to ameliorate sound in there? Is there an avenue for residents to pursue, whether it's um, more plants, I don't know, double glazing? I don't know how do you address this, because obviously it is going to continue to be an issue for for the residents and also then for council to deal with. Is, is there a, a, a process that exists in this kind of instance? Thank you. So through you, Mr Chair, as I understand it, the, the noise at the moment is being generated, generated by the occupants. There's a high turnover because it's short-term accommodation. There are a lot of backpackers, so a lot of the, the noise is associated with the behaviour of people on the property um, and their comings and goings. Um, <laughs> there's nothing, again, there's nothing in the planning scheme that really does allow us to consider um, noise impacts because it is a wholly residential area and it's a little bit different if it was, say, abutting a commercial area or not. When we consider a use as such as the short-term accommodation use, which does require a planning permit, if we were to issue a permit, we could consider mechanisms such as an acoustic fence, sometimes landscaping treatments. So there, there can be design elements that can be incorporated. However, again, for this site under the planning policy that applies here, um, it's not something that council can require. Thank you. Uh, um. So just to clarify, really, it's probably about property owners getting together and seeing if there's any treatments they can do with all of their properties to address it rather than anything council is able to do. And can I ask my extra question? Just with the, um, the traffic of the cars going in, are the car spaces not allocated to specific apartments? So then it wouldn't be the problem of people seeing if there's a, a, a space available. Will that be ameliorated with, with the change um, from the short-term stay? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, Yes, the, the car parking allocation has been proposed as part of this application. The eight car spaces at the front are proposed to be allocated to each of the two bedroom units in the front building. The six car spaces at the rear are proposed to be allocated to six of the two bedroom apartments in the rear building. So that is what has been um, proposed as part of the application. Thank you. Councillor Brand. Can you tell me how much taller the new building is the three-storey building proposed. Is it three storeys or four? Three. three. It's four storeys, isn't it? Is the new building four storeys? Through you, Mr Mayor, it's three storeys. The previous application was four storeys. What am I looking at? Previous application. Oh, bloody hell. Well, excuse me. All right. I was wondering, it's, it's, you know, it's an experience in planning. Um, can I, I just want to have a look at, you can, I'd just like, if, you, if I could just. That's terrific. I've got that. How, and I can actually see how tall the uh, existing building is. Is that right? From some some uh, aspect like that. Anyway, what can you just tell me roughly how uh, how taller than the ridge line of the existing rear building is the parapet of the new building? 
Yes, so through you, Mr Chair, the existing building is 7.92 metres high to the top of the ridge line. The proposed building has a maximum height of 9.47 metres. Um, that's a bit of a test of my maths off the top of my head. Um, it's about one and a half metres difference. Thank you. Um, I sense it's a moment for a motion. Do we have anyone happy to move the officer's recommendation? Um, move Councillor Baxter, seconded um, Councillor Bond. Okay, do you wish to speak to this motion? No? Do you wish to speak, Councillor Bond? Councillor Crawford? I do want to speak. Um, I just wanted to say we do hear your concerns. I do think that this, um, the changing of what it's used for and into smaller number of apartments and um, things like attaching specific cars to specific premises won't fix all of the issues, but I do think it will be a better outcome in general for um, the people that live around there. Of course, I would, I don't know, I think this is a body corporate, there's some things to be maybe that look at how do we ameliorate surround within that space, because unfortunately that's not something that we can address here tonight. Um, but I do think it will be, given the history that we know about over the last few years, it will be a better outcome for residents generally. Anyone else wish to speak? Oh, Councillor Brand? Uh, look, I, I, this is obviously an important development to have done. It, 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 it is going to be an improvement in many, many ways. Um, and I just want to say to, the, uh, to uh, uh, Ms DeVries and her neighbours that I, I just can't, I, I can't see any way of improving this. And if I could, I would have really wanted to help you out on that. Um, but I do think when you look at the top floor of the, of the proposal, <coughs> Uh, it's not nearly as bad as what I was looking at it before, which is the previous proposal. But I just think, uh, I imagine it's been designed without a huge amount of thought about how it might appear, because it's going to be basically invisible from the street. But it, uh, I would imagine that Council would also be um, amenable to um, uh, any minor amendments of the, uh, if, if there was some thought given to the cladding on that top floor being somehow um, improved or upgraded or, or patinated some way, like camouflaged or a shingle sort of pattern or something which would actually return a little bit more beauty to uh, visual beauty. Uh, I can't think of anything else except for asking if that would be con possibly considered by the developer uh, because I don't think we have any power to, to actually impose that. And, um, and I really hope this... Uh, this um, uh, all the good that this uh, development will do is done. So uh, I'm supporting the, the motion. OK. Um, Councillor Baxter, you don't wish to close? I move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thanks very much. Um, the penultimate one, and I apologise for the wait you've had because there's a few speakers for this one, is item 6.5, 28 to 32 Albert Road, South Melbourne. Gail Davis. Is Gail here? Thanks very much, Ms Davis. I apologise for the wait. Hi, my name's Gail Davis. I live uh, at apartment 2402, 38 Albert Road, South Melbourne, to the south of 28 Albert. Um, this is a new application and it, I believe it should comply with the design and development overlays of the DDO 26, especially in regards to the setback on all sides. This application is an overdevelopment of such a small land area 
a requirement to allow a permit would have to include a loading, on-site loading bay, garbage collection and visitor car parking, as the street parking will be extremely limited in the future. On-site visitor car parking will ensure future residents of this development, um, if they need medical staff visits, um, otherwise it would be a concern of finding a space on the street. Contractors to the building would also not um, take up valuable on-street parking that local businesses in the area are going to struggle with going forward. Uh, the layout is poor as apartments and future residents will need to rely on energy to warm, cool and light these apartments. This application does not add merit or value to the heritage area and lacks insight as to the amenities that are required in this special precinct and location. Replacing the commercial area to be a wellness spa is not in keeping with the void of restaurants, etc. we have in this precinct. The height of this new application will dramatically impact on the livability of re residents living at 38 Albert Road to the south, especially the centre core of this neighbouring building. Many of these apartments will have no winter sun, will need to rely on energy to heat, cool and light their apartments. The development of 13 to 21 Palmerston Crescent to the east of this development site um, and their future residents will also be impacted on this height as many of those apartments will all also see no sun and require more energy to make them livable. There is a big concern over overshadowing of not only the parklands to the east, but the South African Boar Memorial when it is returned to the redeveloped Anzac Station and larger Albert Reserve across the road. The new application suggests vehicle cyclists, motorbikes, garbage collection vehicles enter from Palmerston Crescent, pass behind two business car parks to the south that are situated in this um, one-way laneway across the apron behind 50 Albert, their loading bay and car park access across the rear of 23, 21, sorry, across the rear of um, the Palmerston Crescent development, past their loading bay that is going to be situated to the south-east corner, past the rear of 40 Albert, which is their vehicle access, into an alleyway behind 38 Albert Road, where 50% of their vehicles exit from, and then proceed into um, 28 Albert Road. I have, sorry, given designs. The most sensible and safest access into 28 Albert Road should be for vehicles to enter from Albert Road and exit the, one, the rear lane, which reflects the traffic flow from 38 Albert Road. This means that the alleyway behind 28 and 38 Albert become a one direction lane and all vehicles, cyclists, etc., would turn right past the southeast corner of the Palmerston development where their loading bay is going to be and exit into Palmerston Crescent, alleviating congestion of the apron, the loading bay areas and the other business car access points. The Council's idea of a mid-block pedestrian walkthrough from Palmerston Crescent to El Albert Road is a good suggestion. And with the growing developments in Palmerston Crescent, um, this is a safety concern for people walking in to that area. The alleyways and the laneways are for car, are car widths only. And our concern is that if this development at 13 to 21 Palmerston doesn't get built, that the walkway between Albert Road and Palmerston Crescent will never eventuate as the council wishes it to. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Louis Roenick. Hi. Hello. <coughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Lou Roenick. I'm uh, 2605 38 Albert Road, immediately to the south of the proposed development. Um, I'm an owner, resident and also 
chairman of the OC committee um, representing the other owners. So Gail's been through the specifics of this particular development, but in, in if I could sort of give an overview of what's happened here is that there's, after a number of applications and another number of visits to VCAT by, by all of the parties, uh, there is an existing permit in place for a building up to a height of RL60 um, that was approved under a previous scheme. Um, and with the introduction of DDO 26, what the applicant has effectively sought to do is just cherry pick a bit of DDO 26, increase the height from RL60 to RL85, which is effectively an increase in height of about 45% um, without paying any due regard to the other objectives of DDO 26. So it's been a pretty blatantly opportunistic exercise in maximising the built form that he can put on his site without paying due, due regard to the impact on the residents and the, the surrounding area. Um, so that's a effectively pretty much what's happened. And what we're seeking from Council is, we're obviously going to object, take it all the way through VCAT, is seeking Council support in uh, ensuring that the application adequately addresses all of the design objectives in DDO 26, which now applies to that site. Thanks very much, Lou. Okay. Um, Karen Baines, please. Thank you very much, um, Karen Baines. I'm a resident and owner at 18 Albert Road, which is located three buildings north of this particular application site. I um, am an objector to the proposal. Um, however, having read the um, planning committee's report and recommendations, I would urge the councillors to approve this development um, with certain conditions. Um, I applaud the inclusion of the through block connection. Um, I do believe that it is important to the local community that this through block connection is open at the commencement of the use of this building if it is given a permit. Um, however, I do believe that there are some concerns regarding safety in the rear laneway which is used by other buildings as we have heard tonight and that needs to be addressed in some way. Um, if the development of 13 to um, 21 Palmerston Crescent does not go ahead, um, there is a car park there which people from Albert Road use and it's important that they have access to that car park irrespective of whether it is future developed into apartments as per the planning permit. Um, I support the council officers on the inclusion of recommendations with the visitor car parking. I also support them with the waste management and the need to address that and the loading facilities on this, but um, would um, recommend, as I said, um, approval of this um, application. Thanks very much. Uh, Edgar Dobell, Dobell. Uh, my name is Edgar Dobell and I live at uh, 24538 Albert Road. I won't repeat the objections that have been raised by two previous speakers because that would simply waste time and it seems like enough time has been wasted. Um, the, my main concern revolves around the safety issue of egress and ingress from the building, particularly if you drive 
Would you have to exit the, uh, the uh, building, 38, through the back streets, the back lanes, into Palmerston uh, Crescent. And uh, basically, uh, the, the, uh, that laneway is wide enough for one car. So if people start using it as a public thoroughfare between the back of uh, Palmerston and Albert Road, or to, rather than walking around Park Street, it's going to get very cluttered, and I feel for the safety of people that may be wanting to use it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Nick Sutton. Thank you, Chairman, and good evening to you and to the councillors. Uh, I appear here on behalf of the permit applicant, and uh, probably the most efficient thing for me to do is to um, perhaps address some of the uh, objectors' concerns that have been raised before you this evening. Um, I'll start with just quickly the genesis of this proposal. Um, you've heard from one of the objectors that this is an application or a site that has um, some planning history to it. Um, most recently, earlier this year, uh, we revised an existing permit that was approved for the site by reducing the footprint, increasing the side setbacks to the building to the south, which is 34 to 38 Albert Road, as well as creating a podium and doing a number of other things that uh, the objectors and the council ultimately um, agreed to with us. We've always been up front that we would come back through a new process before the council to respond to the new DDO and the new height controls, and that's the matter that's before you this evening. So in effect, we maintain the existing uh, footprint that's been agreed with the objectors and the council previously. Uh, we do add an additional six levels to the building, uh, and that includes an additional 14 apartments. We make some improvements to the internal configuration of the building. We don't change the uh, traffic flow direction to this proposal. Uh, it's maintained in the exact same way with the exact same number of car spaces that we've agreed previously earlier this year with everyone. Um, we uh, would say that we certainly comply with the DDO 26 and we haven't changed it, as I've indicated to you, any of the setback parameters. We maintain the internal walkway, uh, which um, clearly members of the local community and the council are supportive of. Um, we certainly respect what the objectors are saying, uh, but um, we think that any of the remaining concerns are certainly um, readily able to be rectified by way of permit condition. Uh, and perhaps with that, I, I might just put myself um, in your hands, should the council have any questions for me? Uh, I, I actually have a couple. Certainly. Um, Mr Sutton, can you please explain how waste will be collected from the basement of the loading bay and also, um, you might have covered this, um, what your client intends to do with the surplus car parking? Certainly. Uh, so I'll start with the waste uh, question. The waste is intended to be collected from an on-site loading slash waste collection area, which is in the basement. The truck that would collect that waste would access in the same traffic flow as uh, other vehicles to the site, so that would be via the rear laneway, and then it would prop within a loading area which is internal to the site. Um, waste uh, bins are, are stored in the levels underneath that level, and there is a dedicated waste management elevator for the purpose of collecting those bins. An operator would collect those bins, transfer them one by one to the uh, truck, and um, during these times, this would happen in off-peak, so we have bi-directional car park access points for residents of the building, and they would be configured so when that truck was using that space in off-peak hours, uh, it wouldn't interrupt traffic flow or access for other users of the building. Oh, we've got a follow-up question. Yes, certainly. Yes. Um, Councillor Vox. Thank you, Mr Sutton. I'm particularly interested in the waste. Um, I'm just wondering, will the bins be um, dragged and left there for when the 
rubbish truck comes or will they be bought up when the rubbish truck is there one by one? And is that feasible and how long would that take? Um, sort of yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, the, the bins would be brought up when the truck arrives, so the person who would collect those would be the waste management contractor. So they would be brought up one by one, in effect, but they wouldn't all be left up there at the one time. Uh, it would probably take in the order of 10 to 15 minutes, but given this will happen off-peak and there's a dedicated space for it to occur, we're quite confident that it's not going to be an interruption to anyone external to the site, uh, nor the residents of the building either. It will be done professionally. Um, and uh, sorry, Mayor, your second question, I've just had a mental blank. Surplus car spots. Surplus cars, certainly. Um, the surplus cars will be, at this point in time, available to the occupants of the building. So uh, these are clearly large apartments. They're very generous. Um, some of them are, are very large family homes. Uh, or relatively large for apartments, certainly. So we've um, retained the same number of car spaces as the current permit contains. We haven't increased them, um, whilst at the same time we're increasing the number of dwellings and some of those dwellings are quite large. So uh, they're there to provide options and flexibility moving forward, uh, and we think that, that at this point, given there's capacity for those vehicles, they're already approved, is the right outcome to provide future flexibility. If the time comes and uh, ultimately those spaces are not necessary, there is the potential through due uh, process and the amendment process to take those cars out of the development. Um, has anyone, I've got a couple of other questions. Um, uh, Councillor Voss? Thank you. Um, Mr Sutton, yes. in terms of the traffic um, analysis that's been done, how much further uh, did that look um, um, over next door being 40, but how mm. much, um, how far did that look in terms of um, it being able to cope, uh, you know, with... Uh, we heard from one of the um, speakers that yes. it has to navigate quite a, quite a convoluted path to actually get in there. Um, so did your traffic management plan look at that? Yes, we certainly did. Uh, there was an initial uh, traffic report submitted initially with the application last year, and then there was a request for further information which included analysis of all uh, the existing approvals, even buildings that haven't been constructed within the surrounds. Um, and it was quite a broad area that encapsulated both Precinct 2 and Precinct 4 within the DDO 26 area. Uh, so it is certainly something we've considered. I think the reality is that a lot of the buildings that draw upon that space are already developed. You've got 50 Albert, 34 to 38, and the approval um, directly behind this site at 13 to 21 Palmerston Crescent principally takes its cars in its approval from Palmerston Crescent. It just has a loading bay at the rear. So without um, going into all the technical details of that, certainly it has been considered and that's been before the council. Um, Mr Sutton, can I just ask you to um, describe how the pedestrian arcade might operate? Yes, certainly. Uh, so the pedestrian arcade will be available to the public more broadly to use uh, during the day and up to a certain period in the evenings. It will have doors at either end of the arcade that can be locked for safety purposes. For example, we wouldn't want this being a loitering space late at night um, when users of uh, a nearby nightclub, for example, might be tempted to go in that space. So public safety is um, very much at the forefront of our minds, but so is accessibility and, and the community benefit of having a link such as this. So this has been a feature of the proposal um, that's been present over a number of iterations of design for this site. Uh, and in short, the hours of operation of that walkway can be controlled by way of permit condition. Councillor Voss, please. Thank you. Um, Ms Baines meant, um, was quite um, clear about wanting to have that uh, through block connection open upon commencement. Yes. Um, is that the intention or do you have other yes. plans for that? No, certainly the, 
the intention is from day one of this building uh, being able to be occupied that that link will be open. Um, there's benefits to the development in terms of passive surveillance and access to the retail uses on the ground floor, uh, but we've got um, no reason not to have that open. If there was a concern about safety and, and having that open at certain times, that's certainly a matter that can be controlled to a point, uh, but certainly our intention is to have it open. Okay. Sorry, this must feel like a bit of a grilling, I apologise. No, no, no. <laughs> um, thanks very much. You can... Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, questions of the officers, please, councillors? Councillor Voss? Um, thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to confirm um, about the overshadowing into the park and the plans that we have based our commentary on is that the latest location of the South African War Memorial. Are you able to confirm that, please? Through you, Mayor. Um, we don't know the exact location of the um, statue in, in regards to uh, the, the memorial across the road. However, the shadow plans do show that it, um, that the actual reserve um, is line marked on, on the shadow plans and the statue itself will be located to, to the north of the reserve and it's not going to be within the shadows um, of the, the proposal before us on the shadow plans. So it's actually at the edge um, and it actually is not affected. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the pedestrian access, um, uh, is there a possibility that that could just be closed and never opened again? And the you know the whole desire to have that that uh, three block connection never realised. Um, do we need to condition that that it's always open until six or whatever it is? Through you, Mayor. Um, so one of the driving points for this application has been the, the through block, the pedestrian arcade, um, because uh, this part of DDO 26 uh, does lack the, the pedestrian or the through block from Albert Road to Palmerston Crescent. Um, the existing um, permit does have the th through block and there's conditions on permit um, that actually relates to the pedestrian arcade and I can take you to condition, uh, proposed condition 22 and 23. Um, so while it is on private land, we're, we're asking that the uh, pedestrian arcade is open to uh, the public um, up until the hours of midnight and, and not open till the hours between midnight and 6am. Councillor Voss? And what happens in the event that the Palmerston Crescent building is never built? So, um, through you, uh, Mayor, uh, the amendment before us um, to the Minister uh, back in March, we. It's, it's, it's looking at um, some of the, the mandatory controls, but as part of that amendment, we're, we're reinforcing that the through block connections and the landscaping buffers in DDO 26 are important. And so um, this site, together with 13 to 21 Palmerston Crescent, has been marked as a, as a through block, and both sites are Current ha currently have um, existing permits and they both have through box connections, they both have um, conditions on permits. So we do have something in place and, and it's in time that the through block will be there and we hope. Councillor Brand. Um, one of the speakers, Mr Ronick, um, talked about um, how that in effect this this building has has picked up uh, one of the um, allowances I suppose of uh, DDO 26 without actually um, taking on all the other responsibilities. I don't actually understand that. Is 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 there a, a change of DDO between this building and the neighbouring? 
property, or do you understand what he was saying? It sounds really interesting to me, but I just, uh, I just want to sort of follow it up. Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, so, DDO 26, this is in Precinct 4. This is bound by Park Street to Kingsway. Um, all the properties that face Albert Road are in uh, Precinct 4. Precinct 4 originally um, had a height limit of 60 as part of the amendment process. That was increased in height to 85 AHD. So what that means is the, the current permit is at 19 storeys. This application is proposed to go to 20, uh, an, an extra six storeys and it takes it to the maximum of 85 AHD. Um, what it doesn't, so we have conditions on permit in regards to the 4.5 metre setback from the rear. So some of those balconies actually do encroach. So we, we've actually got a condition on permit to ensure that is 4.5. Um, it does exceed 4.5 that it faces the south apartments. So the Rothy Lohman building where the objectors which face out to the site and it's more than 4.5. What it doesn't meet and it's a discretion discretionary requirement of 4.5 is the southern boundary and it does have a hard um, wall on the boundary um, and we say that that is okay because then it will respond to the property next door if that is up for redevelopment. But we do have a condition on permit that talks about that wall that's going to be exposed and we'd like some architectural treatment on that. Um, I, that sounds all good, but I, I didn't quite understand something. Um, by reapplying, is, they have taken advantage of now of being in a new regulatory height limit, for instance, that is, they can take advantage of now. Are there, other, are there other regulations that have come in with that, in the, with that new provision that they are not complying with? Or have you just outlined them for me just then? Through you, Mayor, I've just briefly outlined them through, and, and we're talking about an extra six levels. We're, we're talking about an extra 12 apartments. Um, we, we do have larger apartments, um, and so the requirements are almost the same. What is different is, is the height, and the setbacks is still a discretionary requirement. And the, the contentious point is the 4.5 metre setback um, is discretionary from the southern boundary. However, we do have an existing permit and the existing permit doesn't meet all those discretionary requirements. Councillors, we've had quite a few questions on this, but one more from Councillor Voss. Thank you. So apart from the southern boundary, boundary not meeting um, the design objectives, is there anything else? That, that it doesn't meet. Through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, northern setback uh, from the northern boundary, as it was uh, discussed before, it doesn't meet the setback control, but it, it's built onto a, a existing boundary wall, um, which is the same as the current approval, and we think it's uh, in a, a development that would allow for the equal development of those two sites in the future. Councillors, um, I think we're getting close to resolution time. Councillor Copsey? I'll move the officer's recommendation. Good on you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss? Councillor Voss, do you wish to talk to this? Just briefly, um, say, uh, um, myself and the other Gateway Ward councillors attended uh, the consultation for this. So we've heard a lot about this particular property and the concerns of the community. I think it's come a long way since the previous application and I do think it's a much better application. I still do have concerns um, around... Uh, I'm very troubled about the rubbish going up and down um, the floors to be emptied. I think in a brand new modern building with such fantastic amenity, we are still wheeling up and down bins one at a time in, in the uh, inner lift. It just doesn't seem right to me. Um, but I am happy uh, with how um, the two lifts have now been, the two car lifts have sort of 
will be working along with the loading bay and the rubbish and um, ingress and egress I think is okay. I do think there'll be a bit of getting used to um, the extra traffic and um, the, the two ways out the back there. Um, I am particularly also happy about the mid-block connection. I do think it's a good one. Um, and um, given that there's more visitor car parking now and um, loading facilities, I'm very happy to support this application in its current form. Councillor Pearl. Thanks, just waiting to be called upon. Um, thanks for calling on me. Thanks for everybody for waiting out um, what is a pretty long night. Yeah, but yeah. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, we changed the agenda on you, so uh, thanks for, thanks for um, I was going to use the word enduring. It's not enduring. It's thanks for being patient and sitting and waiting around. Uh, there's some wonderful things to like about this proposal in many respects. The laneway is a, is a rare community benefit that will be provided, and it's been thoughtfully put through, and we thank you for doing that. I, I think... Uh, I tend to agree. I think it's an overuse of the site in terms of height limit, uh, but that's not something uh, we can change necessarily here. Um, but I, I think the original height on the original plan would have been um, more appropriate, but understand that you've, you've maximised the density within the planning scheme. Um, the, the use of the back laneway of this building is uh, intensive, as are the buildings next to it, and, and again goes to lack of planning in the overall uh, overlay. Uh, but again, in terms of this individual proposal, um, uh, I will support it on the basis that uh, on a net net, it, um, it, is a, it is a reasonable proposition, albeit I think it has a number of flaws that could be... Uh, vastly improved, but uh, I don't think we're going to achieve that based on the current wording of the planning scheme for this area. Um, thank you very much. Councillor Brand. Yes, I'm, I'm basically supportive. I, I certainly love the idea of the laneway. The more connectivity that we can achieve in the city, especially in a city of very large buildings, is, you know, the better. It's really, it's, it's great. I'm very pleased with that. Um, the, the canyon between the two buildings uh, has been improved. It's wider, but I still... Gosh, the people in the next-door place are going to be shocked, I think, at, at the canyon that they're in, but not surprised, because everybody knows what they're, what they're buying into in situations like this, and, and they will be compensated in this one, at least, by some very beautiful apartment layouts. That's really a very sophisticated and beautiful um, plan on some of these floors. So good luck and um, I think we've probably come out of this very well on, on average. Councillor uh, Copsey, do you wish to close? Oh, sorry, Councillor Crawford. Uh. I just wanted to say I will be supporting this because I do think the outcomes will be better that with these conditions. But I do look forward to the day when we really have changed our thinking around the inner city, but particularly there are key areas we can't just all have cars and move around the way we have in the past. It has to actually, I'm just putting it out there, and it's my little bugbear, we can't be one, we can't everyone have a car. It, it really, there are certain parts, actually it's the, no, our whole municipality has to th rethink how we get around, and it doesn't look like it did in the past. So I do think that that's part of the thinking, particularly in this area, that we need to, as a council, keep putting out we have to move around differently because it's going to be gridlock if we don't. Thanks very much, Councillor Copsey. Don't wish to close. Um, move to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? It's carried unanimously. Six point six seven Hewenden Road, St Kilda East. Um, thanks for waiting, Mark. I'll just wait until... Um, we lose all our South Melbourne people. So, there's... Uh, one speaker, Mark Chester, for the uh, applicant. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you had me 
quite worried earlier when someone suggested that some of the earlier speakers may have been here for this matter, and that would have yeah, been, been unusual. Um, look, this is an application for six townhouses on a um, site of 725 square metres in the general residential zone, not affected by any overlays. The only permit trigger here is buildings and works. Um, and I suppose that on a previous application that I, I spoke about this evening, I discussed the, the Balancing Act and the sort of acknowledged a give and take in that particular situation. Um, in this case, I, I'd put it to the committee that there is really quite overwhelming state and local planning policy support for this particular application. Um, and before I just touch on some of that, like res code and the like, um, I, I've noticed that this evening there's been a fair bit of discussion on amenity and the quality of architecture and everything else. This is an interesting site in that Hewenden Road, uh, it just takes one walk down Hewenden Road to understand that 1960s masonry, three and four storey apartment buildings with limited setbacks, virtually no landscaping, essentially dominate this, this street. Um, to maintain character, well there's a great example just there, but to maintain character is one requirement and an important one, but on the other hand, I don't think we want to go back to the ways of um, some of the buildings that you're seeing up on, on the screen at this point in time. So the current proposal seeks to pay respect, pay due respect to the architecture with the use of masonry. Um, it's generally three-storey three, three story built form, two storeys obviously at the rear, but just improve. And by that, I'd say increase setbacks um, and just better, better townhouses. Um, as, a, as a council and as a planning consultant, townhouses seem to be the, the flavour of, of the month, at least in the, in the, in the last six, months, six to 12 months. And we're seeing plenty of townhouses with reverse living, um, somewhat smaller balconies. In this case, we're talking about townhouses with proper courtyards, um, proper landscaping, uh, proper laundry facilities, um, a basement car park with extra large storage space, storage within the apartment, within the townhouses, sorry. Um, I'm, I'd stop short at saying that this is like a benchmark, but what I would say is, is that for those people that are seeking something perhaps more affordable or just a general desire to live in a smaller product than some of the houses that have been raised about heritage overlays and, and the like, without sacrificing amenity and general layout, this I would submit to the committee is actually a really great outcome. Um, probably more on the technical side from a planning perspective, uh, I'd say that the property to the north is a large three-storey apartment building. The property to the east has four townhouses that are quite jam-packed. And on that note, I'll probably jump to the conditions that I wish to discuss with the committee um, without presuming your position on, on the planning permit. But there are a couple of conditions I'd like to raise. Um, the first one relates to the fence, and that is condition 1G. In this instance, a 1.8 metre high fence is proposed that is, that is solid. The planning officer is recommending a 1.5 metre high fence with a low masonry plinth and um, palisade fencing being the primary material. Immediately adjacent to this site at number nine is a 1.8 metre high fence that is described as an anomaly. The reason why it might be described as an anomaly is because it is the only property in the street that is housing or hiding a secluded private open space. We would submit that in this case, the secluded private open space for townhouse one and townhouse two that is immediately behind the um, fence would have its security and, and the like jeopardised if we were, go, were to go with a 1.5 metre high fence of such an open nature. So I, I think it's a, a serious consideration there. Um, they'd still get an adequate outlook. The other two items, one relates to a, a sight line, which is condition 1H, and I think that perhaps if you were to speak to the planning officer, they might see that there might be a slight error um, or they might have missed 
something from the traffic department in that, in that regard, and it should be deleted. It's just a, a minor issue. And the other one is 1K and 1L, which relates to external shading and double glazing. The external shading is hard to follow as a permit condition. We're not exactly sure why it's there. It doesn't seem to appear in the best tool. We've achieved best practice. Perhaps if we could at least identify the windows that, that need to be sh um, shattered, then yep. Then, then that would be great. And the last one is double glazing. We would submit that the ESD report suggests that only the bedrooms and living rooms require double glazing to meet best practice. Thank you, committee. My question's for officers. So if Councillor Browns wants to ask a question of the applicant. You're asking about the... Uh the front fence. Um, you're suggesting, uh, and then you're suggesting another compromise. Uh, if if the fence were to be made solid, and and no, if the fence were to be kept, were, were to be made uh, see-through, that it would be put on the street frontage, on the on the on the footpath line, property line at the front. Uh, through chairman, I, I would say that if if the type of fence that is currently proposed by the planning officer was to be supported by the committee, then I would suggest, and I'm not an architect, perhaps some members of the committee are, that it would be a poor, <laughs> a, a, a poor design option to have a low masonry plinth X number of metres from the property boundary with landscaping in front of it, given that the landscaping is primarily going to be behind it to create that level of screening and security and the landscape plan submitted with the drawings would sort of show that. So that's, yes, I would be suggesting that. I don't really understand what you're suggesting. Are you saying that that fence would become dysfunctional uh, with all of the greenery in front of it? No, I'm saying that the proposed... The, uh, no, what I'm saying is the, the, the proposal is for a low masonry fence with um, palisade, fence, palisade fencing in between um, some pillars to a height of 1.5. I think that the design with the setback is, for the allow, is to allow for the growth of landscaping in front of that fence. In front of the wall, yeah. In front, in front of the wall. There's not going to be much of a wall under a 1.5 metre high fence with primarily palisade fencing and a low masonry plinth. So, uh, so the corollary would be that you would, if, you, if that was imposed on you, then you would ask if you could put the, the, the fence on the footpath and put the greenery that will be growing up to screen, the, the, the residents will be able to grow up to screen themselves will be behind that fence, rather than that by the footpath. Said far better than I did, exactly. Anyway, uh, thanks very much. Uh, no. uh, councillors, do you have uh, any questions of the officers? Councillor Copsey? I just wanted to um, get the officers' take on the shading um, condition and the reason for requesting that. I think it's number J in the copy that we have. Can I answer that initially uh, through the Mayor? Um, council officers, and remiss of me to raise at the start of the item that uh, council officers have offered up a, an alternate recommendation, certainly have looked at the concerns raised by the applicant in, in, pre, in a recent discussion. So um, officers are looking at uh, deleting condition 1H in relation to the sight lines. Um, in regard to condition 1J, we've identified the, with some clarity the windows that are looking at being um, shaded through either a shading device or an overhang. And condition 1K, we're actually asking that a notation on the plan stating that all habitable room, all habitable room windows and glass doors will be gla double glazed. So we specified which of those windows are. We um, so, and I'll allow, I'll allow Mr. Spencer to discuss 1G. A point of clarification there. Yep. Um, J is about a clothesline in ours. Um, Yes, uh, but the alternate recommendation no, that I, is before I, you um, has deleted condition 1H, so we've renumbered as well. Sorry, I should have clarified the paper copy of J. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's renumbered. Um, Mr Borg, I've got a question. What does habitable room mean in this context? That's bedrooms? It's, yeah. 
essentially bedrooms and uh, living areas. But not laundry kitchen? No, not laundry kitchen or bathroom, bathrooms. Right. Any other questions? Councillor Brand? So, is that a normal regulation that, that if you... Uh, is, that, is that the way it normally works, that if you double glaze your house or your apartment to meet certain standards, that uh, you can generally leave out the bathroom and the laundry, bathrooms, toilets, laundries from double glazing and still not really affect its rating? It just, I mean, it just surprises me. I'm not saying... Yeah, I'm surprised. I don't know. Through you, uh, Mayor. There's... Uh, the, this condition... This amended condition, recommended condition um, is really reflecting a commitment by, made by the permit applicant in its sustainable design assessment. Now, as, um, as Mr Chester has indicated, the best practice, uh, best tool has, uh, sorry, the best tool is being used and it's, and it's achieved best practice. Now, there's still a condition on the permit requiring an, an endorsed sustainable design assessment we're conscious of, the, of a need to provide some kind of flexi flexibility in terms of meeting that requirement. Um, but there has been a commitment made in the SDA that all habitable room windows will be double glazed. So we've, real, we've, we've essentially reflected that commitment and required that to be included on the plans. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the officer also, um with the front fence, I can see a logic that if you have a, a tall masonry front fence that, you, that it's a good design thing to put screening plants in front of that and it would be quite a reasonable visual outcome. But if for other reasons or related reasons we wanted to um, uh, not have that full masonry fence but a lower palisade fence, uh, which would mean for privacy, the, the occupants of the land behind would, uh, they're free to grow um, screening plants. But it might be better for them to be doing it behind the fence and the new palisade fence could, would actually be not nearly so harsh on the, uh, uh, visually harsh on the footpath so that you wouldn't need the plants in front of it but the plants behind it would do. Are, you, are we happy with that swap if that was proposed as an amendment? Either by us or by to your satisfaction at the end well it would be to it would be to council's satisfaction but that's precisely what we're suggesting by the condition is to get rid of the 2 meter high fence put a 1.5 meter high fence with a brick plinth and and palisade inserts and there would be landscaping behind that yeah so they can they can in the amended plan they would move it to the or property line, and we'd be happy with that. Absolutely. Yep. Councillor Crawford. So um, I just want to clarify. So what is, do we have a fencing policy? Is it based on street, or is it just to kind of keep it at a height so we're not, like, totally shutting each other out and we can still kind of have safe, passive um, surveillance of our neighbourhoods and maybe have a community? Is that kind of the thinking behind having a reasonably not-too-high fence? <coughs> Uh, through you, uh, Mayor, uh, fundamentally ResCode re requires an, a, um, a consideration of the neighbourhood character. That's what it really boils down to. And one of the other aspects about fencing is ResCode talks about trying to avoid high fences. Uh, a fence doesn't need a permit if it's 1.5 metres or less in it, it, any fence in a heritage overlay needs a, a front fence in a heritage overlay needs a permit, but not in this instance, because there's no heritage overlay affecting the site. Um, the design detail of res, standard of Resco talks about ensuring that the design of fences um, complements the architecture and the surrounding area. So, the reason behind requiring a, a plinth with some palisades is. Is by, it does reference nearby fences, and it also provides some um, some pub, some public realm engagement and and, and really a, a sense of not being blocked off from blocked off from the from, from the footpath. 
Well, since we're close to a resolution, thank you, Councillor Copsey. Move the officer's alternative recommendation. That's with changes to deletion of H, old H, and um, changes to uh, new J. Second it, I'll second it. Speakers, do you wish to speak? I'm happy not to speak. Any councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brand? I'm, hap I'm, I'm happy to go with this. Uh, I, I, I feel a little hesitant about the fence. I think, actually, the fence is going to look better the way it's designed. But I doubt that there's going to be support for that. I think that a, the, a um, compromise around the other way, as suggested by Mr Chester and uh, allowed by uh, planning officers, be pretty good too. So. I don't think I'm going to change that. I'm not going to try to change that either. Thanks very much. Uh, any other councillors? Do you wish to close, Councillor Copsey? All those in favour? That's unanimous. I'd now like to move 6.10, Statutory Planning Delegate Report. There are no speakers from the gallery. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss. Um, I'll just go straight to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous. Um, there's no urgent business of which I'm aware, no confidential matters. Declare the meeting closed. Thanks very much, everyone.